Hi folks, welcome to this video on bonds. In this particular question, we can see that we have a $5 million face value bond, 10 years, so it matures in 10 years. The coupon is 6% and we know that the bonds are um, issued on August the 1st, 2000 X2. Um, the bonds are due, as we said, in 10 years. That would be July 31, X12. And don't and you can see here the bonds are uh, paying interest semi-annually. So when we uh, calculate our proceeds, we need to make, make sure that we set our N at 20 because it's a 10-year bond and there's two payments a year. Don't forget, N indicates the number of interest payments we're going to make on the bond. So now in our question, they gave us the yield. So we have to do a couple of different things. First of all, we have to calculate the proceeds uh, from issue. So at the issue date, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. You can see in the solution to requirement uh, one here, we typically use our calculator. So how would we do this? Using the calculator, we would put in our face value and again, make it plus or minus because it's going to be an outflow at the date we pay back the investors and that's our future value of what we're paying them back. We know we have a payment or an interest payment to make them every six months of 150,000 and that's an outflow for the issuer. So um, how we get 150,000 is we take the face value times the coupon, which is 6%, but don't forget we make the coupon payment semi-annually, so we have to multiply by a half. We know from the question the yield is 8%, so we're going to use that 8% yield as our I slash Y, use N equals 20 as we said earlier, and when we compute PV, we get 4,320,484. Now what I did here is I also showed you how you could do it using the tables, because in the textbook they use a lot of tables um, uh, throughout the text but you, uh, on your quizzes or midterm or whatever, you can, any testing at the college, our preference obviously is to use the calculator. So, but if you were using the tables, um, uh, what you would do is you would look up two cash flow streams. Uh, the repayment of your principal, which is your first cash flow stream. So again, you would be paying back $5 million at the end of 10 years. So we have to look up the factor that's that equates on the tables to paying back a dollar um, in, uh, um, in 20 periods or 10 years uh, given the yield. So now because we're paying back um, uh, or our yield is 8% as per the question, since we have a semi-annual bond, we need to look up I equals 4%, not 8%. We have to cut it in half because the bond is paying interest twice. And you'll notice the tables are all set up based on the yield, not the coupon. So I have to calculate the present value of two cash flow streams, the lump sum cash flow stream at the end, and also the interest payment, which is 150000 every six months for two years. So to calculate the present value of the... Um, of the uh, lump sum payment, the face value, uh, using the tables, I'm going to go down the present value of a dollar table and look up the present value of a dollar associated with a yield of 4%, which is half of one year because it's a semi-annual bond, and N equals 20. And if I go down the 4% column and across the N equals 20 row for period, I get a factor of 0.45639. So this means, if I multiply those two together, that means that I as the issuer would need $2,281,950 today in order to pay them back, they being the investors, $5 million in 10 years. I also need to figure out how much I need to have today in order to pay $150,000, which is the interest payment, um, to investors every six months for 10 years. So I'm going to go to my present value of an annuity, uh, an ordinary annuity, and I'm going to look up 4% as my yield because again, it's 8% for the year, 4% for a half a year because the bond pays interest semi-annually and look up N equals 20 because there's 20 interest periods. And I'm going to get a factor of 13.59033, which multiplied by 150 would give me 2,038,550. So this tells me that in order for me to pay back $150,000 every six months 
for the next 20 periods, I'm going to need to have $2,038,550 from investors today at issue date. If I add those two cash flows, the present value of those two cash flow streams together, I'm going to get $4,320,500. Now you'll see that number is a bit different than the one we calculate with the calculator, but that's because we've used the tables. So just be mindful that when you're using the tables, you may, as the uh, face value of the bond increases and the um, years to maturity increase, you may get an answer that's slightly different than you will use in the tables as opposed to using the calculator, all right? Now, in requirement two, we changed the uh, required on you here a little bit to make you assume that the yield is not 8%, but five and a half. And now they want you to assume that the bond was issued on August the 1st, X2, not August the 1st, or sorry, August the 1st, X4, not August the 1st, X2, as we've been doing that uh, when we did requirement one. So they've changed things on you. This is where the question becomes a little bit tricky because one of the things you had to realize here is that now, after the bond was issued initially or in our initial uh, assumption at July, August 1st, X2, the next interest payment would have been made January 31st, X3, January 31st, X3, and then July 31st, X3, right? So the interest payments would have occurred right after the issue date, August 1, X2. If we're not issuing it until August 1st, X4, we're not there to get any January and July interest payments, right? We're not there. So the idea here is that if you're not there to get them, when you're calculating the present value of the bond, you now don't use N equals 20 you have to use n equals um, 14, uh, 16. Why? Because you've missed payments. The payments missed in this case would be the fact that you weren't there to receive the January 31st X3 payment, the July 31st X3 payment, the January 31st X4 payment, or the July 31st X4 payment because here it says the bond didn't get issued until August 1st, X4. So four interest payments slipped by. You weren't there to get them because the bond didn't get issued until August 1, X4. So now when you're calculating using your calculator with the present value of the bond was at issue date, you need to change two things. You need to change your I slash Y to five because they asked you to assume the yield was five. And now you have to make your N 16. Why? Because if the, if the bond is only being issued on August the 1st, you're not going to be there to get August 1st X4. You weren't there to get the first four interest payments. So you're only entitled to getting the remaining payments, which are 16. So if we did a compute PV, we get 5,326,000. 375. Now, you can use the calcul or the tables as well. Um, I'm not going to go through the details of using the tables because I know most of you are using the, the calculator, but just be mindful of the fact that as we did up here when we did the um, uh, requirement one using the tables, we need to make sure that we use the yield to look up on the tables. And because it's a semi-annual bond, we cut that yield of 5% in requirement two and a half to two percent. And you have to remember your N is 16, just like you did when you used the calculator. And you will get a present value using the tables that again, you can see is slightly different from what we would get if we use the calculator. Now, let's have a look at requirement three. Requirement three said to calculate the proceeds at the issue date, assuming the yield is now back to 8% and the bond was issued on October 1st, X2, and it still had the original maturity. Now in this question, they asked you to exclude accrued interest because you'll remember that because the bond uh, was only issued on October 1st, X2, the next interest payment that comes up you can buy that up. So in other words, the bond is dated August 1st, X2, 
and then two months later it was issued on October 1st. So that means because the next interest payment hasn't been made and you're going to get it, they're going to give you a full six months of interest even though you would have only held the bond from October the 1st to um, uh, uh, January 31st, which is four months. So if you're going to get six months interest, even though you only held the bond for four months, you have to pay up front for the first two months interest, which is August and September. So now they didn't want you to include the accrued interest calculation when you were calculating proceeds. They're only asking you to do the present value. In the fourth part of the question, I will now ask you to redo uh, s some parts of it and include the accrued interest and you'll see a little bit on how it's different. But the idea here is that we need to calculate the present value on October 1st, X2, which is not the issue date, or sorry, which is not an interest payment date and it's not the date the bonds are dated. So now, in order to do that, what I've done for you here is I tried to draw out, draw out a little bit of a timeline for you, just to help you understand how we're gonna deal with that two month thing we talked about earlier. This is the date the bonds are dated. In requirement one, we've already calculated the present value at that date. This is the issue date, that according to requirement three. And this is our first interest payment date. Now, it strikes me that in order for me to answer requirement three, I have to come up with the present value at the issue date, which is October 1st. In requirement one, we already know the present value at August the 1st. It seems realistic to me that the best way to do this would be knowing the present value at August 1st. If we could find the present value of the bond, after we make that first interest payment on January 31st, X3, it means to me that I could calculate the present value at the issue date. It must lie somewhere between here and here. It lies in between that one and that one. I know that. The present value has to be between. How can I do this? Well, what I could do is I could calculate the uh, amount of the amortized discount. So remember we said the carrying value or present value of a bond, at, at a discount bond at any time would be the difference between or would be the amount that was amortized. So I know by knowing the present value August 1st X2 and the present value January 31st X3, I know the difference between these two numbers here is $22,000 eight hundred and nineteen dollars that must be the amount of discount that got amortized that's for six months but if I can calculate it for this two month period from August to October and add the amount of amortized discount to this number my present value at August 1st that would give me my present value at the issue date so all I did was take my present value at August the 1st Add to it two months of six times two twenty two eight nineteen. Why two months of six? Well, from August to October, that's two months. This represents this twenty two eight nineteen represents amortized discount for six months. If I know amortized discount for two months, I can add it to the present value that opens the period within which the issue date falls, and I can get my present value of four million. $328.90. So that's the answer to requirement three. Now, what, and it doesn't include any accrued interest. Now, what you could do here, you could also do up a table if you wanted to. So now what I did here, I'll just get rid of this for a moment so we can still work on requirement three. Because it's, it's, it's still fairly close, your actual issue date is fairly close to your um, bond date, you might want to do up a little table. And you could say, well, I'll set up the period, which was the original issue date, set up my interest payment, interest expense, amortized and unamortized bond discount, and the carrying value at the end. So all I've done here is I've said, well, if, if this was the issue date, it wasn't in requirement three, but if it was, I would have had my bond at 
4,320,484, an unamortized discount, which is the difference between the face value and the carrying value, which is 679,516. Now, I already calculated, okay, earlier on, okay, or I already know on January 31st that my carry, my carrying value of the bond when I did my present value calculation here is 4,343,303. So, how would I get from here to here? Well, the difference between these two amounts would be what? My amortized discount, which is calculated as what? The difference between my interest payment and the interest expense for six months. That's six months from August the 1st to January 31st. That's my expense. This little A here will show you how I got it. I took the carrying value to open the period within which, okay, this interest payment falls. And I added or I multiplied it by 8%, which is the yield in requirement three, and multiplied it by a half because the bond pays interest semi-annually. And I'm going to get this number. The difference between interest expense and payment is the amount of discount that gets amortized. So if I add this amortized discount to um, this, right, I am going to get this. But I don't want, but I only want two uh, six months of six of this so that I can get to this number. I'm only going from August the 1st to October 1st, which is two months of six. So if I take two sixths of it, okay, I'm going to get this number plus two sixths of that number, which we have here, and that's going to give me $4,328.90. Okay, hopefully that's helpful. Now we're going to do requirement four. And in requirement four, what I asked you to do, I added this to the question. Using this data, so we're back to an 8% yield. We're still assuming an October 1st issue date. And uh, what I wanted you to do is to make the entry to record the issuance of the bond on October the 1st. But I also wanted you to include the cash, the cash interest that the investor had to pay up front. Don't forget, they're going to get the full six months interest payment on January 31st, but they've only been in the game since October the 1st, which is four months. So for them to earn the right to get a full six months interest after only having been there for four, they have to pay two months interest, August and September up front. So in that case, all we're gonna do is we're going to do some calculation here. We know that our cash would be what? It would be the present value of the bond that we calculated. So the cash is equal to present value of the bond at October 1st, X2, plus the accrued interest. Well, we already know the present value of the bond at October 1st, X2. We know that that is 4,328,000. 090, right? We know that. We just calculated that. Accrued interest is going to be 150000 for two months, but we only want it for two of six months. So that's going to give us another 50000 So that's where we get 4378090. So you've got to be careful because 7, 8, and 2, 8 look very close. Like they look, you know, you could very easily miss that. But it's important that you know the cash proceeds that are received always include any accrued interest. That's what the issuer expects to get. So that's how we calculated the cash. We know that we've got a bond payable of 5 million at the issue date. And we also know our interest payable. We're going to credit interest payable. Why? Because we have to pay the investors back on January 31st, six months interest. Part of the six months that we're going to pay them back is what they gave us up front when the bond was issued. So the issuer credits the interest payable because that's two of the six months of interest that we're going to pay them back on the next interest payment date, which is January 31st, X3. So we set up the interest payable. So now the bond discount, we can plug it to balance the entry, but it's calculated as the difference between the present value of the bond at October 1st, X2, which we calculated in requirement three, and the face value, which is $5 million. Okay, so this concludes 
our problem um, uh, for this video. I hope you found it helpful.